Reggie. How you doing, sir? How you doing, bud? Good, good. Hold, hold on one second. Let me just bring in Phil, too. Just give me a second. Okay, no problem. Phil, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Reggie, are you there? Yes, sir. Hey, Reggie. So, How you doing, Phil? Good, man. How are you? Good, good. Good. Yes. So, Reg, Hi. um, what I think I what what I'd like to do is, okay, is I have you know a list of questions, and I'd like it to be more of a discussion than I'm just sort of questioning you as okay. as it relates to your story. Okay. Um, you know, I think for me, when you look at like this story now tw in 2020, what you have is a is hundreds if not thousands of internet clips of different pieces of the story Correct. whether it's phil whether it's kading whether it's you and yeah. i think some of my questions are just to hear the story from you i've never spoken to you yeah. um and and hearing your thoughts on some of this stuff so the, the place i wanted to start that has always interested me and i, I haven't heard you talk about it that much was your time at the Compton Police Department. How many years were okay. you there? How, how me, many years did you work on the street? Okay, let me, before I go into that, I wanted to ask, I wanted to, you know, I do have like 10 or 15 questions I would like to ask Phil as, as, as far as the investigation goes. Uh, sure. It, you know, this is as long as we have enough. Cause I'm an open book. You know, the only one, there's only one thing I ask you, one name we, I ask you not to mention. And this if we can just refer to, to that person that's Teresa Swan. And other than that, you can ask me any questions or anything. Um, okay. And then I won't, nothing's off, you know, nothing's off limit. Um, uh, but, you know, I would like to ask Phil some things, you know, because I have been getting notes and stuff like that from, from you know, things that's been out there. And so, okay. you know, all, all I'm just asking yeah, if you give me that, that opportunity. I'm, I'm, yeah. Hey, Reggie, just to let you know, I'm, I'm cool with that too, man. I mean, any questions that you have for me, Okay. If I can answer that 100%. I'll answer them. I got no I'll, issues with that. I appreciate it. And then, um, yeah. and so we'll be, uh, we'll be able to, uh, put this on both, both, uh, you know, both platforms. Uh, but I will wow. respect doing it, you know, at the same time. I won't try to jump the gun or anything like that. So you just, yeah, tell me no, we'll, you... we'll coordinate, we'll coordinate exactly when we're going to release it. And yeah, we'll release it on the same day. It'll be, okay good for both of the platforms a hundred percent okay okay that's all i ask are you planning on hopefully you plan on doing it this wednesday right i don't want to hold on to it too long <laughs> uh, no no i think yeah i think the plan is we're going to release it on thursday okay yeah 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 okay yeah yeah right. no i i, I want to get it done i'm not going to spend time editing it i'm just going to run it as an interview um and and run it on thursday okay great great well um well, i'm ready whenever you are now so your time at the at the com I'm not going to spend that much time, but I'm just curious. What was your time at the Compton Police Department like? How old were you, and okay. what was that like? Yeah, so I started off in the jail uh, in 1985. Is when I first got hired. I I was hired as a community service officer, and a uh, and then eventually became a jailer for the city of Compton <clears throat> until 1989. And then I went to the police academy in 1989 and became a police officer, police recruit for those six months, however long it took to go through the police academy. And then from 89 until uh, 1996, I was a police officer. So technically, what's that, seven years? Uh, yeah. Seven years. But and I worked for the city of Compton, you know, for 11 years as a you know, jailer slash police also. And your father was there at that same time, right? He was he was in sort of the upper echelon of the Compton Police Department, correct? Uh, uh yes. Uh, you know, most of that took. Uh, yeah, I guess he started promoting in like eighty. He promoted because he started late as a police officer. To be honest, he didn't start until uh nineteen seventy nine, actually. And uh, he um, he was like 30 years of age when he became a police officer. Uh, but he was a reserve for three years prior to that, from 1976 till 1979. Uh, but 
Yes. So he started promoting. I think he made Sergeant in like 87 or 88 or something like that. And what year exactly did you open up or start Right Way Security? Uh, 1995. I had a uh, traffic accident. Uh, actually, the first accident I had that messed up my ankle that caused me to get vascular necrosis was in 1995, uh, maybe 1994. I forget. December the 17th, uh, 1994, I had a traffic accident. And then I uh, rehabilitated, came back to work, and then I uh, re-injured my ankle on the job. And and when you started Right Way Security, you said it was it was so we're saying ninety five, ninety six, roughly. And as someone who owns a security company, it's not uncommon for police officers to work for a security company, right? That was that's just standard practice. Correct. I was selling. And, that was, okay, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm, if you yeah. if you have more to add, that was my sell pitch. Back then, if you know, prior to 90, you know, to actually 94, 95, everybody was just having the big, big, big heavy set uh, bodyguards. And my my pitch was to uh, the record labels and to the company was to have police officers that can be good witnesses and, uh, uh, for the inmates because, not the inmates, <laughs> for the uh, artists because, you know, they didn't, they had that, that image of not wanting to, uh, you know, get on the stand to testify. And so that was my guy's uh, job to do. They wasn't hired assassins or anything like that, um, but they were hired to be good witnesses for, uh, well, that's, for the artists. They're, they're, when, you, when you say hire them to be good witnesses, are you then assuming that when these guys, these cops become, um, you know, security officers for these uh, rap artists, you're then jumping to the assumption that there's going to be some some altercations or or what have you. There's that that that, that was reason. that had happened. That had happened. Yeah. And so yeah, you know they, you got to remember the record company had just came off of a major lawsuit with Snoop Dogg and and, um, right. and the main reason for that was because uh, their bodyguard wasn't really armed. I mean he wasn't even authorized to be armed, uh, even though you know. It prevailed in the lawsuit, but uh, I mean, in in the uh, in the, the criminal part, they ate their butts off in the lawsuit, in the civil lawsuit. And I think it's fair to say too that um, let's just say a fair number of the the artists uh, had convicted uh, felony charges against them, so they couldn't physically be allowed to carry weapons, and so. Obviously, having a police officer being able to carry a weapon was something that uh, that the artist, I mean, that, that that made them happy that they knew somebody was there that could be carrying a gun and legally be doing it as well. I'm sure that 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 um, helped, you know, with the, the sale pitch. But my main sale pitch was the part about being a good, reliable witness. Okay. And excuse me if y'all can barely hear me. I have a bad cold today. <laughs> I've been having flu symptoms all week. I'm hoping it's not COVID. I got check check for COVID, uh, <clears throat> and so I'll give my results tomorrow. But I'm feeling like crap. <laughs> but go ahead. I'm all sorry. right. Um. So it's fair to say you hired from Long Beach PD, Hawthorne PD, Inglewood, Compton, LAPD. You hired and recruited from all of the surrounding police departments, correct? Uh. It was pretty much guys that wanted to work. To be honest, originally, originally, I had a good, a good team of officers. I had uh, about six or eight from Compton. I had uh, uh, about three or four from Long Beach. I didn't have any from uh, uh, Hartthorn, and I didn't have any from Inglewood. And then I had Kevin Hackey from Compton uh, School Police. Um, and then I had. Later, I, you know, got Rich McCauley from LAPD, but originally it was mainly the Compton police officers that was working for me. However, um, my chief pulled our work permits uh, um, sometime during that. It was before the L-Ray incident, our, our work permits got pulled 
Uh, but for some reason, our work permits got pulled, and um, and so I lost a lot of the, um, the competent cops, and they made me had to start hiring guys that were like reserve police officers that had gun permits or retired police officers. Hey Reggie, can you talk into the phone? I lost the last part of that. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, that's way better. Yeah. Okay. So no. I repeat it again. I said I mainly had reserve police officers or retired police officers. Uh, and like I said, the only LAPD officers that I have, let me reiterate, the only ones that ever worked for me was a guy named Rich McCauley. And he didn't start working for me until about, uh, about 1995, 1996. And um, McCauley... I had like two other ones, I believe Ken Sultan and uh, David Love that worked like one or two video shoots for me. And those were the only LAPD officers that ever worked for me. So that uh, was my next question. So you did hire Richard McCauley um, and he did, he did work at death row. Yes, he did. And would it have been uncommon for other people to have been hired at death row without you knowing? Oh, for sure. Uh, as far as law enforcement, police officers or security, um, should then hire any uh, security uh, police officers. Um, uh, you know, he, he left that up to me. I was a childhood friend and he put that in my hands. That's why he always say, anybody, if you talk about cops, he always will tell you, those are Reggie people. <laughs> Um, he he had no relationship with any police officers. Got you. And in 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 one one name that I'm curious about, and and what he has stated, and and where you where you or your knowledge of this lies, is you know there was a guy inside the LAPD named Kenneth Knox, and yeah. Kenneth Knox was doing an investigation into the studio in Tarzana. And Kenneth Knox, you know, is the one who writes a report that states that David Mack and Raphael Perez were at that studio. What's your what's your thoughts on that? Well, I've never heard that or read that anywhere. Um, when I read some of Kenneth Knox, I read that even in, in Liberate, his book, and that was never mentioned there. Uh, Kenneth, Kenneth Knox were trying to do an abatement on the studio. Uh, but Kenneth Knox told some lies as well because he tried to make it seem like he interviewed or talked to me before. I wouldn't know Kenneth Knox if he walked in and slapped me right now. I've never met Kenneth Knox before. His informant was mainly Kevin Lewis, who was the studio manager. That's the only person that had a relationship with Kenneth Knox. And Kevin Lewis worked at the studio in Tarzana? He, he was in charge of the studio. Kevin Lewis, yeah. And so... You're saying you had no knowledge of, of of David Mack and Raphael Perez being around the studio in Tarzana. They had never been up to the studio uh, at all. I would have known if any cops were coming in up to the studio. Trust me, my, my security would have been talking about it. I don't even think your boy Kevin Hackey even said that. <laughs> or any any security ever even really said that. But they came up to Tarzana studio to can Okay. Okay. Um, now, in, in 1996, in sort of the summer uh, around that time place, there seemed to be some federal investigations that were going on into death row by the ATF, the IRS, possibly the FBI. When you guys were going through that, was, was, was that sort of, was that something you were aware of or, or was something, it was information you found <laughs> out later on? I didn't find out about the investigation until after uh, I think Chick was taken into custody <laughs> on the probation violation. That's when uh, Dan McMullen and an ATF agent by the name of John met me at the uh, House of Blues, uh, House of Blues, and um, on Hollywood on Sunset, and said that they needed to talk to me, and they wanted to uh, put some things on the table and let me know what was going on, and it was been investigated. And so I guess that's why Bill Carson calls me an FBI informant, because he knows as well. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, oh, hey, Reggie, hold on a second. 
when have I ever said that you're an FBI informant? They, that's on your on the podcast on the podcast. No, no, no. You're mis- you're 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 listening to the wrong okay. podcast. Then I have uh, never ever <laughs> stated you were an FBI informant. I want to be clear about that. Okay, well that's good to clear up. <laughs> so, okay, that's what people. I just want to make sure. Okay, well, that's no, good. People, okay, that's good. People, I respect that. Right. I respect that. All right. I respect that. All right. Okay. But I was like, whoa, the only time I can be able to consider an FBI informant is when I talked to, uh, I did, and I did talk to Dan McBullen, and she was aware of it, and um, David Kenner was aware of it. And, um, you know, um, all that was... Well, let, me, let, me, let, oh, yeah. let me let me, let me, me backtrack. Well, first of all, why don't you tell people who Dan McMullen is? I know Dan who Dan McMullen is, but why don't you say Dan McMullen is an FBI agent. That was assigned to uh, investigate that uh, death row for, I believe, those uh, items you just uh, you just laid out. And I think the main reason they came at me because they found out I was a witness on Alton McDonald's uh, case, where, where Alton McDonald, who's known as Buntry, was they they picked up his case and tried to go after him federally for a uh, gun arrest <coughs> and. I had witnessed the gun to be in possession of Zeke uh, a week prior to that, and I was testifying on behalf of uh, of Alton McDonald that that Zeke is the one who had that gun and threw that at Alton McDonald's feet when he was exiting the car, and they just wanted to get my uh, testimony prior to going to uh, court. Okay. Is Dan McMullen the only FBI agent you've ever spoken with? Yes. Well, in regards to that, uh, I, I... No, I'm talking ha- about at all. It, at all. No. Any, uh, any I, talked, I talked to uh, an FBI agent by the name of... Uh, I believe his name was LJ. I called him LJ. Okay. Uh, he yep. uh, was investigating uh, racketeering or not racketeering, something going on in Vegas as far as... Um, politicians been on the take and I uh brought Teresa Swan down there to uh talk about some dealings with the club uh where they thought uh some some Vegas uh, politicians were on the take. Okay. No you're no you and you you're correct. And by the way, just to kinda maybe fill in a couple blanks. Okay. Um L, uh, yeah. LJ was my partner and you okay. you met with me too. Just oh, okay. You, I didn't you, even may not, you may not, you may, yeah, no, and, and you know what? I mean, I know it was a long time ago, but uh, no, we've, we've met numerous times just to let you know. I, and apparently you don't remember me, which is, which is understandable. It's been I so didn't many remember years. That no, I didn't. Okay. I remember LJ. No uh, yeah. But, but there LJ was somebody was with L, LJ. Okay. okay yeah. Fair. LJ was okay. my partner. And uh, by the way, when you see your father, Reggie senior, you can tell him I said hi as well. So, uh, Why you, you got him me. out here thinking he's he's corrupt. <laughs> What's that? Everybody got him What's thinking that? that he's the most corrupt Compton comp- officer ever. If, 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 I, put it this way. I have no control over what other people say. But like I said, I've never said that you were an FBI informant. I've never said your father's corrupt. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm just, I'm just being straight with you, right? Okay. All right, that's all we can okay. do. Okay. Yep. Cool. All that's right. Fine. Sorry, Don. Appreciate go ahead. you saying that. Because I believe oh, yeah, Mark no Anderson, I believe Mark Anderson was the one, either him or Mike Coet was the one that facilitated me coming down meeting. I don't, I think it was a, uh, I believe it was Mark Anderson that that that, that, that made the introduction. It was a Compton police okay. officer that uh, worked on a federal task force with you guys. Yeah, well, Coet ended up working on the the um, the task force with Katie and all the other guys as well too. Correct. When they, and that's why so. I always last when Richard, uh, uh, y'all guy, y'all brought Richard on the uh, show, um, Valdemar. Um, Valdemar, and, right? And he said that I'm a pie rule, and I never arrested any any pie rules. And I'm like, boy, I arrested Poochie before, I arrested Neckbone before, and <laughs> and he talked to Mike Coet. <laughs> I'm sure he explained the reason that a lot of things happened was because of my relationship with Mike Coet. And I was like, I don't know why Richard is, is 
is making all the allegations because he doesn't he doesn't know me. I don't know Richard at all. But anyway. Okay. All right. Anyway. So, and at, at okay. this at this time that all of these um federal investigations were going on, what were they looking into? What was it guns? Was it drugs? What was this okay. all about? Well we're talking different time periods. So we better get our time periods right. <laughs> um Dan McMullen was going I, I really believe it was the gun case and um with with Buntry. But that stopped in like two thousand two um like in two thousand. And then, you know, because nine eleven nine eleven happened and they just the FBI uh just started focusing, <laughs> you know, on the terrorist act, on the you know, the terrorist thing. And all we were found guilty of were failing to file uh federal income tax, meaning death row, death row records, misdemeanor filing. That's all that came out of that investigation. Now Hey, can I ask you one I'm sorry, go ahead, Reg. Sorry about that. No, I was gonna I was just gonna ask you one question. So from <coughs> what you're telling us, um I want to make sure I, I understand this correctly. All the security for death row records, Shug handed that over to you. And so you ran all the payroll and you did all the hiring and firing or what have you of the, of the officers that work security for death row through right way security. Is that correct? correct? Correct. That is correct. Okay. Are you aware of any officers that were actually hired by death row records and paid under the table? And if so, do you know how they were paid? Okay. The only person that ever, you know, because I talked to everybody after all of the accusations come up, is Sharita Knight uh, says that for well, a private party that Snoop had in like 94 or 95, uh, he had for a family reunion, for Snoop Dogg's family reunion, she hired, she hired because she was his manager, four or five cops that were Kevin Gaines' friends to work uh, private security at, at the family reunion. And I don't know if this was before right way was, was around. It had to be because I always had two, two guards on, on, on Snoop, and my two guys would have told me, which was Marcus and Kenneth. Those were the two Inglewood Unified School Police officers. So they definitely would have told me. And so I believe those are the only times that I ever know of any uh, any police officers been hired. So um, if I were to tell you, them. okay. So if I were to tell you that there were police officers that were hired directly by death row and they were paid under the table and we knew how they were being paid under the table and were able to track it, you would be unaware of all that? Of course, of course. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I will be unaware, and I would, I would like you to tell me who they are, because it's easy just to throw it out. <laughs> but no, I'm just, I, yep, I'm just asking if you were, if yeah, no problem. Uh, All right. Okay. Now let me say this: there was another incident where one LAPD officer, and this is before I started working for Death Row. Uh, it was a Snoop Dogg's um, uh, album release party on a boat, a yacht. Uh. There was one LAPD officer. I heard they uh, got in trouble or something like that. That was working on the uh, on the uh, on the boat or something like that. And and he's the only other officer, but his name was Donovan. Uh, he wasn't one of the guys that you know everybody always mentioned in this rampart stuff. He wasn't one of those guys. Uh, that's the only time that you, the only time that you're aware of it. And that's like ninety four. Correct? Ninety correct, ninety four, ninety three. But like I said, that's just okay. from learning things after all of this stuff. I didn't even know about okay. this prior to uh working for Duffy. But while you were running but while you're running right way securities and you're providing security for death row artists, you you're you're telling me you're not aware of any police officers that were hired for security for death row and that were being paid under the table. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Reggie, just so we're clear, the list of people that, and I don't know the full list, but it was Kevin Hackey who was from Compton. Mm -hmm. It was Kenneth Archer. Was it Kenneth Archer? 
Those are, those are the ones came later, but he worked Inglewood Unified School Police. Yes, not and Inglewood. And Leslie PD. Leslie Golden. Another Inglewood Unified School Police. Kenneth Cooper. Kenneth Cooper. No, a uh, Hagen Cooper. He was a, a retired uh, sergeant from Banning PD. But no, no uh, Kenneth Cooper. My, Michael Moore. He was the the fireman. Uh, Federal fireman, yes. And Al Gittins. He was a retired or uh, a reserve uh, member in Lino County Sheriff. And and the rumor that which I don't think is true, but you can tell me the the officers um, that were doing. And it was an area with plenty more. It was plenty more, but go ahead. Okay. Okay. The, the the officers that were doing security for Biggie on that night, um, Rick Stewart, Kevin Lane, Cesar Herrera, Dorian Burton, Rick Swell, and Reggie Blaylock, they never worked for you, right? That you never provided security the night that Biggie wa was killed, right? Correct. Correct. That's right. Okay. And those names, you don't know those names, or, or did you come across just, those names? Just coming across them reading, you know, from reading in books and stuff like that. After all of this incident Got that happened. Yeah. Got you. Well, what was your relationship like with David Kenner? Was he a business lawyer? Was he a criminal lawyer? Or was he both? What What was your relationship like with him? David Kenner is one of the top five smartest men I ever met. Uh, you know how to talk and put things in perspective. Um, got part with his hands in the cookie jar, uh, which was making sure uh, push away from me. Um, uh, but he made a lot of good. He did a lot of good things for Suge Knight and Death Row Records. And he, um, he was both though. To make you know, to answer your question. He did. He, and he and did how lot. are you? Are you? Are you? Do you still have a relationship with David Kenner? Are you guys still <clears throat> cool, or 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 did that? Did you separate yourself from him? Uh, David Kenner, I can call him right now, and we'll speak or talk. But um, you know, I haven't had a reason to really need him. If if my case would have been federally that I got caught up for, I would have been in L.A. I might have used him. I'm just scared of David because he's always sick. He's very sickly. And he used that uh, to to miss a lot of court dates. Uh, but he's a um, very smart attorney. Uh, him and David Chesnall. Um, I think they're uh, two good attorneys, but he's old now, you know, so. Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So when Suge went to jail um, behind behind the events in in Las Vegas, what was the agreement between you and Suge? Was was it that you were going to run Death Row Records? Was that what really happened, or was it more of you just were kind of in the middle of things? Yeah. So that came on later. What happened was I was actually trying to break away at that time. My plan was just to go ahead and. I started doing work with Mac 10 uh, security, you know, in his video shoots. I was trying to branch off, branch away, to be honest, you know, to get, keep my security company going. But then his brother in law, who was in charge at the time, Norris Anderson, he, he lost some um, interest. He he had some domestic issues going on with, with his with his sister, Karen. And he didn't care anymore. And things were falling apart. I'm not even talking about the record company. I'm talking about things personally. Uh, automobiles where, where, where people were just driving around in his cars. And this guy named Denny from Ultra, Ultra Limousines and stuff had his wife driving around and shows 500 Ben. And people were just taking advantage of the situation. And I was like, wait a minute. I know shit wasn't like this. And so that's when I inserted myself as far as trying to get his stuff secured, his property secured. And people were trying to hide me from me, meaning Norris. I found out later. But she wrote me a letter, which uh, the FBI got. 
uh, when they raided my house, not the FBI, but uh, Russell Poole and them guy, uh, when they raided my house, and, and it's like, man, what's going on? I haven't you know, heard nothing about you. And uh, I heard you had your son. No, it was actually my daughter at the time. I heard you had a daughter, congratulations. And um, it was like nobody had told him anything I was out there doing. And so that's what Mr. Lay was like. She didn't want you to come see him, Reggie. And uh, I came and saw him, and he was like, man, I thought you abandoned me. I thought, you know, nobody's telling you anything, telling me anything about you. And I was like, well, I was just sitting back, you know. And he was locked down for a while, and then from there, he was like, man, I'm going to get rid of the norms, and me and you going to just take care of dealing with stuff, get everything back to, or, in track. And that was like in July of 1997. And uh, that's when I took over. And that's what from there. And when when did it go into bankruptcy? What year was that? Oh, that was uh, 2007, uh, 2006. So that was like... Uh, so for, for, for 10 years, were you involved? Or did you leave no, at a certain point? No, I left. And uh, when he came home in 2002... Um, he brought all the homeboys. I had pretty much got rid of everybody as far as working. Got a professional staff and had the company doing okay. Uh, you know, um, I got Dan McMullen and them, um, the U.S. attorney. Uh, I forget if he was an Asian guy, Kwong or Kwang. Forget his name. But got them off our back and we we'll started we was doing good. <clears throat> and he came back home on the gangster tip and that's when i was like okay i i, I can't have my doors kicked in no more by the fbi uh, or, or, or lapd and trust me it was about to happen because things were just going on starting all over i saw 95 96 all over again and i didn't want that and so i left i left the company when i started working for a company called american music and down in California. Got it. Um, around the time of all of this stuff, Chief Bernard Parks did an interview and went on the record and stated <laughs> that LAPD officers worked for death row as security officers, and many of them were involved in crimes. We all know that Chief Parks has never really spoken that much about this, but he did go on the record and say that. How do you answer to that, that that he's basically saying LAPD officers worked at death row and committed crimes? Now, you have stated it's only Macaulay, so there was no other LAPD officers that worked for death row, to your no, knowledge. No other, to my knowledge, no other. It's kind of muffled. I can't, I, I can't understand to my knowledge, saying. Okay, excuse me. To, to my knowledge, no other uh, LA. PD officers on the day being, I uh, believe his name is Ken Sutton, and Rich McCauley was for the death row record. Don, I can't understand. Oh. Can you just speak I, again I, into the phone, Reg? Yeah, I okay. couldn't understand anything you're saying, Reggie. Sorry about okay, that. how about now? Yeah, Perfect. that's good. There you go. Okay. Yep. I said, to my knowledge, no other police officers work for death row records, uh, but Richard McCauley, Ken Sutton, and a David Love. And David Love and Ken Sutton, if they work for me more than two times, I would be surprised. <clears throat> so where do uh, Chief Parks get that from, statement from? Uh, I don't know. Um, but Rich McCauley was the only one that worked for me. Okay, let, me let me throw something out there. Um, sure. when, the, uh, when the El Rey Theater shooting happened back in, uh, what was it, March of 95, um there were a ton of police officers that were working off duty um for private security for all the artists that were right there after that shooting happened all of those officers they gathered them up and not one of them said they saw anything okay. a bunch of those police a bunch of those police officers were okay. lapd okay yeah, let me respond part, that, let me on, respond to that Virginia, yeah. okay okay let me just add a little bit more Okay. After that happened, 
that's when Parks finally said, you know what, enough is enough. We know this has been going on. I've been telling our police officers they can't do off-duty jobs at death row records. Um, there were memorandums that were put out there that, that people have. Um, I don't know if they're public or not, but people have them. And finally, after the Elray Theater shooting happened and no police officers said they saw anything, which means now you don't have witnesses, that's when he finally said enough is enough and he's not going to allow LAPD officers um, to do private security at death row. Just that's, okay. that's where probably Parks is. Then he probably had that press conference that Don was referencing. So go ahead. Let me say this. Number one, it wasn't a shooting. It was a beatdown. It wasn't no gun. A beat, yeah, it was a gang member. Yeah. Um, but number two, Death Row uh, didn't have uh, security uh, at that location. It was a private security. It was the, the L. Ray security was the one working for her. And those were, if any LAPD officer was working there, they were working for the security company that had a security contract at the L. Ray Theater. All the Correct. Death Row. There's two, but there. No, there's, you're correct, but let me stop you for a second. Okay. There's two different security companies that are going on, though, at this correct. point. Correct, correct. El, El Rey Theater has their own security, correct. but the individual artists also have their own private security who were with the artists inside the El Rey Theater when the beatdown happened of the gang member that got killed. And, and, and the death row artists that have security there all worked correct. the right way at that time, and that was... Some Compton police officers that weren't disciplined, or we we came and met with uh, the black officer from the Wilshire Division. Uh, uh, forget his name. Uh, after it all happened, we reported it. I had a strap on my balls and let the chief know that we were there, and um, because we had also had the order where we wasn't supposed to be working there, but uh, I had like four guys there. I was working with artists. And they were all Compton cops. There were no LAPD cops even there working for me at the time. Code 4 was a private security company that was owned by a guy named Tom Gibby that was one of the security companies that ran the outside, the door of the location. But inside the location, I was a private security company that had a contract with the LA Theater. And I don't know where any of the officers worked for or worked at. In in uh with Kevin Hackey, Reg, um, you know, there's been this portrayal of him as he's crazy, unstable. The thing I'm curious about is, and and I know this, I, I don't know if it happened. It, I think it happened in the last few years. Kevin Hackey sold his security business for millions and millions of dollars. Um, he had a great contract. You know, he had all the Verizons and Del Tacos. Great contract. Yeah. Not Verizon. And so, but the Verizons are AT&Ts. All the at and Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I heard in upwards of even close to $10 million or Whoa. it was a it was a really large number that he sold his security firm for. Mm -hmm. My question is, is where what's your analysis of Kevin Hackey? Is he crazy? Not crazy? Mm -hmm. A guy who runs a business like that, I would think, would have to have a little bit of head on his shoulders, right? Yeah, I, I have no problem. I don't know if you know. Uh, Kevin and I have been in communications. Kevin has since apologized to me for all the, the statements. Kevin Hackey, uh, when I was incarcerated, probably put over $1,500 on my books at a time period just to say, hey, here's $300. Hope you're doing okay. Here's three hundred dollars. Hope everything going okay. <clears throat> now he wants all of this to go away, uh, mainly because Kevin Hackey did a lot of lying, and um, that's why he wants all of this to go away because he's worked now for attorneys. He got a private investigative services where he worked for for attorneys, and his credibility will get shot if he had to retract all of this, all of this stuff that he's been saying. Um, he, he, I still know he'll never be able to go testify in a federal court again if he has to retract all of the statements that he made because his credibility will be shot. And so that's why he won't talk or, or do anything anymore. But no, I, I, I hate that 
you know, that Kevin was out there with Frank and they're making all the accusations, but even Frank wanted to apologize. Uh, they got him on record. R.J. Bonds was saying how uh, Frank wanted to even apologize. So the guys know that they were out there making all these false statements against Reggie Wright. And now they all of a sudden want to apologize and want all of this just to go away. But unfortunately, we got conspirators out there that want to keep this stuff going. And I got to fight it. Or I got to respond to it because I can't just let people. I, I mean, I sat back and didn't say anything for, for 10 to 15 years. And look what type of community grew up from that. It just blew up, meaning that you right killed Tupac and Biggie. <laughs> you right, that's responsible for the death of Biggie and Tupac. It's because I never responded. And so that's why now I go hard with responding to uh, the accusations because I can't have that in my legacy. Um, fair enough, fair enough. The, your relationship or not, what, what was your relationship with Sharitha Knight? Sharitha? Sharitha and I, uh, been knowing each other since she was 14 and I was 16. Actually, uh, she came to a party with my sister and I used to date her cousin, Anita. I was dating her cousin, Anita, and that's how, uh, Shug and Sharita met at a house party in like 1980, I believe, 80, 82. Uh, but she was the cousin of of um, a girl I dated by the name of Anita Martin. And so I guess we had a good relationship. And were you around when she was around Kevin Gaines? What was your relationship with Kevin Gaines? Never met Kevin Gaines, never seen Kevin Gaines before in my life. I knew, I knew that she was dating a cop because I knew the things that she was saying, but didn't have any idea who he was or um, anything about him. But I could tell she was dating a cop. And so when this was all going on, did anyone from LAPD's robbery homicide come and question you as it relates to the murder of Dave? Um, yes. I mean, uh, I don't know if they've robbed robbery homicide. You know, to be honest, I don't know where they were from. But I then had officers come uh, to my office at Right Way Protective Services. And at that point, that's when I turned over paperwork to them, uh, showing them my payroll and everybody that worked for me. Uh, they were mainly questioning who worked for me and stuff like that. I could I, w I couldn't tell you the officer's name. Uh, I could tell you the officer's name after the Greg Greg Cadence task force, but not prior to that. So let's talk a little bit about about Greg Cading and 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 his theory. Just out of curiosity in talking to you, why is it do you believe that what Greg Kading has written and what Greg Kading investigated is the truth? Why do you personally believe that? Well, number one, because it's crazy to me. Everybody always say, well, PPD is lying. Poor Greg to cover up or to get out of the case. Uh, you guys are getting muffled again. If you can, okay. Reggie, I don't know what's going on with your phone, but it's just really hard to understand you. Okay. Uh, that's well, what that's I, better. Okay. I I, I believe, uh, I always believe the South Side Compton Crips has something to do with the shooting of Tupac because that just sort of made sense after the beat down inside the, uh, inside the club and from the investigations that was found, you know, like the, the gun, the, uh, the ammo, the ammunition that was found by Tim Brennan and them that match the ammo that was found at the scene. Uh, the white Cadillac. Um, and I thought Bobby Baker, which is the guy I'm sure Phil, Phil, Phil Carson knows as well. He worked on the task force there. Uh, but I found that, that that to be not true. Well, Bobby Baker had found a white Cadillac that had some repair work done on it that had been shot up. Uh, I, for a long time, thought that to have been true, which I don't think it's, uh, they, that turned out to, not to be true. Um, but just the two plus two, 
It's just that simple. That beat down, and they were supposed to retaliate like they did in that game culture world. And that's why um, I believe that. Uh, on the biggie side, um, I know because of conversations with Ms. Swan and the way she uh, was terrified of uh, of Pucci and how he was always coming, pushing up on them for money. And um, I think she was relieved when he finally got killed. And just from hearing her talk and the, and the fear of, 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 of Wardell that she had of Pucci. Um, I got a phone call from Roderick Reed, who, uh, who was convinced that uh, that Pucci had something to do with it. And he kind of said, Reggie, you know. And, you know, like, like I knew. He was like, you know this to be true. The way, you know, that because that, he was trying to tell me that Pucci was out to hunt for me and was trying to kill kill me for sure, which I didn't believe that part. But that's just because Roger Reed wanted to know where Shug was living because he wanted to have some bad happen to Shug Knight. Uh, but, you know, I wasn't going for that. And I told him I might be mad as shit right now, but I don't want nothing bad to happen to him. And so, uh, this conversations like that is what me make me believe that people believe or took credit for it. To say that it happened, nobody knows of Pucci and God, <laughs> but Pucci sure so, took credit. It, he sure took credit for it. Yeah. So my, I guess my question is then. If if you believe that Teresa Swan um, was a go-between or an intermediary in that she delivered money on the request of Suge to have Biggie killed, um, and you also believe that Greg Kading went and questioned Teresa Swan while holding over her head you know, immunity, not only for her, but immunity for you. The question I, I still just don't understand is, is if that was what happened, let me, let me why? Clarify. Let me correct something. Cause that, that, that's okay. the one thing that's out there. Reggie, again, also, try to, you're, you're coming, okay. Reg, Reggie, hold on a second. You're, okay. people are going to have a real hard time following and understanding what you're saying. Just to let you know, it's coming through really hard to understand. Okay. Let me say yeah, this. Try to be a little more quick. Thanks. Okay. Let me say this. Um, I was offered immunity. I didn't accept You're what? It. I was offered I immunity. Understand. Go ahead. Okay. I was offered immunity. I was never, I never accepted immunity or was given immunity on any of the cases. It was offered to me. But once I realized what they were investigating. By who? By, I was offered it by Greg Cadence. At the beginning, okay. they had arrested Teresa Swan, and right when they had her in handcuffs, an FBI agent named Jeff, I don't know his last name, Jeff? Yeah, he was on the task force. Yeah. Jeff, Mike Coyette, and his partner came to my house and showed me a picture, uh, showed me a picture of Teresa Swan in handcuffs. And they were like, it's going down, Reggie, you know. We just want to show you that this room. And Greg Cadence then called me and told me, hey, you're becoming hit. I'm mean, the pre you're coming to talk to me. And I told him, you know, I have my attorney, Roger Rosen, contact y'all. Again, I, like, Reggie, I'm sorry. Reg, Reggie, I'm sorry. Guys, this is, I cannot understand a word he's saying. <clears throat> this is not coming through good. Okay. I think, Reg, now? you just try it. When you talk into the phone, like directly into the phone, I can hear you clearly. Okay. How about now? That's, that's yeah, perfect. perfect. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So, so Roger Rosen was like, uh, uh, I told him to contact my attorney, Roger Rosen, and they sent him a, a immunity agreement. But once I realized what they were investigating, I was like, I don't need no immunity agreement on no biggie shooting. And I turned it down. And so that's when Teresa Swan, though, 
they gave her a they they started meeting with her and i guess they showed her a letter and she immediately started crying and was like and she called me but they let her stop and said reggie they got me they got me and i'm like what i said shit had you involved in some shit like that and so that's when i called greg cadence and said hey greg the deal that you offered me, I don't need. But can you offer it to Teresa Swan? So that's how this whole immunity thing come up. Reggie Wright has never uh, accepted any immunity agreement on either one of the cases. Okay, that that thank you for that that clarification. the The next question is, is for the LAPD if they really truly felt that Poochie did it, that Teresa um, did it, why why were detectives like Steve Katz hiding information in his desk? Why wouldn't they just pr prosecute the case? Even if he's dead, it would make everything go away. Why, why are they hiding files? That part I can't answer because uh, I don't know. But I can also tell you that they were still trying to uh, pursue the case. They had Teresa Swan go and meet with Shet Knight before. And she tried to get him to talk. And all they got on tape was him pointing at the sky. Telling him, why are you talking about this? The only person that knows about this. He pointed to him, her, himself, and up and up to the sky. We need the person that's dead. They got that on tape. That's all he was saying. And and this letter that they showed Teresa Swan, you're you're clear. You know that that letter was written and was fabricated by Greg Cading and another officer. Correct. You're clear on that. I'm clear on that. Yes. They okay. try to show it to me as so well. They showed you a fake letter. They try to, yes, they brought that to me as well. It wasn't, Greg Cain was off the case by then. Uh, Dupree and um, this black, another black officer named Martin or something like that. Uh, they met with me and they showed me the letter as well. And are y'all aware that I took a polygraph exam on all of this? Um, I'm mm -hmm. not aware of that, no. Okay. I don't know if Phil was. No. no. Okay. No, you and know what? Just back, back up, back up a second here, because this is something I didn't know. Was when that fictitious, fictitious letter was written up. Are you saying Kading was off the case or was still on the case? When they try to show it to me, not to, not yeah. to, not to Teresa Sola. Okay. Why wasn't Kading on the case, and and why wasn't he part of showing this letter to you? Uh, he was taken off the case, and I'm sure y'all know why, because of the, the George Tory situation. Because of how he got jammed up on, was it false testimony, or I know people got released that had been prosecuted on that case, correct? On the Torres case? Correct. Okay. And why well, would they take to, him off? I'm just yeah, curious, why, uh, what, what's your understanding, Reg, you being a, um, you know, a former police officer? Why would they take Kading off of this case if he'd been involved in it from the very beginning um, after he had been found, um, I don't know what's the word, um, being involved in the, uh, the problems with the, uh, the Torres conviction? Why would they take him off the, uh, off the Biggie case because of that? What was your understanding? You know what would why. be your understanding? You know, you know well, once you I, use I credibility, you. you know, once you use credibility okay. in the courts, <laughs> You're right. no good to any uh, investigation. So I just want to make sure I understand. Kading was taken off of the case that he supposedly was being very much involved with and in part of this fabricated letter, but the LAPD took him off the case because he had lost credibility because of what? False testimony and they had to overturn some convictions in the Torres murder case that he was involved in. Is that correct? I don't know. what. I just want to make sure I understand it. I don't want to, I don't okay. want to, you know, I don't know what the situation was. I just know. Yeah, and I don't, I don't want to make assumptions. I just didn't know if you knew. That's what I was asking. Okay. No, I don't know. No problem. 
Well, I, okay. I, I will say that the judge in the case, Judge Stephen F. or Stephen V. Wilson, threw out close to 50 federal convictions because of what he deemed Kading's reckless disregard for the truth. So there was close to 50 federal convictions that were thrown out in federal court because of Kading's credibility. Okay, but do that mean that what he found in this investigation to be untrue? <clears throat> he had, wasn't it, 16 other people that worked on the uh, task force as well? I don't, on, I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer to that question. I don't think 15 of those people wrote a book and made a movie. Yeah. Reggie, you're smarter than this, man. Come on. Oh, I'm not let, saying let me, that. Let me, let me, let, let, yeah. you, Reggie, you, you're, 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 you're a smart guy. You, you are. I got, I got no issues with you at all. You're a good dude. You're a funny guy and you're a smart guy. You're a former cop. You ran your own, uh, security company and did very well with it. But come on, man. You know exactly why he got taken off the case. Oh, I said you know it. Why I cop, and, 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 and you know why cops get taken off the case? Because when they do, like you said, when they lose credibility, and this is nothing against Katie. This yeah. is against any cop, any cop. That, that lies or does anything to lose credibility and then to have to vacate 50 federal convictions. <clears throat> well, my question to you guys are... There were 16 other people on that case. So are they all uh, lying? The other 16? And it wasn't all LAPD cops. There were some FBI agents, uh, ATF agents, EA agents. <laughs> well, no, I know, I know. But just, just to clarify it, a majority were LAPD officers. I think you had Coetta with the sheriff. You had, you had two FBI. You had a DEA. But again, these are these I think are Caden's words is if he was leading the task force, which again, that's I don't know. If you if you if you ever and, and again, I don't want to go down the whole Greg Caden issue because I, I've never met the guy and so I don't I don't have any issues with him. I just have an issue with any cop that does some of the things that he has been accused of doing and and loses credibility and gives cops a bad name and then turns around and goes ahead and writes a book, publishes a book himself when, I don't know if you've spoken, Reggie, to any of the other officers on this task force. Trust me, I know Mike Coet very well, uh, Tim okay. Brennan very well, and they're not happy with yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah, they're not happy with with uh, Katie at all. Correct. In fact, in fact, one of them, and you, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I've been told this. Uh, let's just say one of the members of that task force is so upset with Katie and the and the the book and the bullshit that's in it that they're thinking of writing their own book to set the story straight because like you said it's not it's not fair to have one bad cop on a task force um be representative of say the other 10 or 12 or whatever members of that task force who are doing a good honest job and trying to get to the bottom of things is that fair to say correct that's all my whole okay. point to bringing that up was just saying hey yeah if if he's bad okay or do that make all the other 14 or 15 officers on the case find this to be inaccurate? That's all I'm trying to say. Yeah. Gotcha. Nope, we're cool. Yeah. Okay. So, Reg, you've already said and, and pretty clear that the only LAPD officers that were around rightway security or worked for rightway security was McCauley um, and the other two officers, Ken Sutton and David Love. I'm going to just pose another question to you, and I don't know if you've ever been asked this. It's one thing if you're running a security company, and, and obviously Suge is his own man. He's running around doing whatever he's doing, interacting with whoever he's interacting. Is there a world that exists that you're basically saying, with all of this other evidence that exists, that it's it's unrealistic that... David Mack or Raphael Perez were involved in the murder of Biggie. Are you saying full stop? There's no way they were involved in that murder. Why? I mean, you know, why would they? What's their motive for for death row? I'm not saying they didn't do it on their own. If, if, you know, if they fans or groupies, like some would like to make them out. Who knows? But I can tell you. You skirt. You skirt. You skirt the question. You're skirting no. the question of what Don asked you. I'm going, I'm going to respond to you're, it. 
I'm, okay. I don't think no one knows them from their pro records is what I'm what, what I'm going to say. I I they done gave up 70 officers. I mean, 70 fellow officers. They have never in life mentioned my name. That they know me or know anything about Reginald Wright ever. They done turned on all type of people, good friends, best friends, cops, been in the police car with them and everything. I don't know these guys. They have never mentioned the name Reggie Wright Jr. or Sr. Yeah, no, I, that's what I'm saying, though. I'm saying, is it possible, unbeknownst to you, mm-hmm. that this was, this was orchestrated or happened and, and that it was done without your knowledge? But that's not what the claim's been. That's not what your whole show been about. Your whole show been saying that these people were related to me and had relationships with me. And I don't have any, I don't know these guys. They never even mentioned my name. There's been phone records. I'm sure y'all don't put my phone records. There's no phone records with with me and them. There's no trace to any of us. But everybody want to keep linking, linking them to us. Well, I mean, I'm not even finished sure. telling this. I'm not finished telling the story. That's why I'm sitting here talking to you and and okay. asking these questions. Okay. Is is for that particular reason? Is is this idea, you know? that there there is an overwhelming amount of evidence and an overwhelming amount of things that went on inside the LAPD to protect these two officers and to protect not letting that information be put out into the public or be put out into the criminal justice system. And you have to ask why, you know? And, and I'm, I remain to, to be swayed either way, yeah. but I just say, hey, Reg, you, you were running a business. It's, it's not like you could keep your tabs on hundreds of people or 50 people or whoever was around Suge at all this time. Is it, is it seemingly possible that it happened somehow, some way, unbeknownst to you? I mean, I'm sure that could have happened, but... That's not what the accusations are. And I'm just saying that I don't believe Suge Knight knew Rafael Perez or David Mack. They, people try to say that they grew up in, in Compton with us. I never even heard of David Mack. I don't even know what neighborhood he grew up in or where. People just say he grew up in Compton with, with Suge, but never show where. Tell us the street. Give us the address. Where? We don't know anything about these about this man, but everybody keeps throwing that out there. Let me ask you this, Reggie. Let me ask you this. Okay. It's a known fact that David Mack grew up in Compton. Okay? It is. You know, Hold on, Reggie. You know that. I know that. Let's I, don't know that. I don't know that. I don't know that. Wait a minute. I don't know that. I don't know that. I don't know that. I don't know anything about okay, well, this let's... man. He ran track at Oregon and used to date Flo Joe. Okay. 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 Well, let, let me, let me fill you in on a couple of things then. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. okay. David Mack grew up in Compton. Where? Whether you know it, Where? Or don't know it. Stop. Where, Phil? Bro, you want me to, you know what? Where? You want me to tell you the exact street number? Please. I, uh, please. This way. Or, so or me, just, let just, me ask just Reggie, Reggie, slow down. Slow down. Slow down. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. slow down. Slow oh, yeah. down. Did Suge Knight grow up in Compton? Yes, he did. Okay. Do I, do I know his address? But you know, know uh, you know what area, you know what area, you know, he grew up in the mob Pyro area. Yes. Compton is, Compton is not a big place. Eight miles wide. Eight miles wide. Yeah. Yeah, It's not a very big place for, that's the first city. That's not a very big place. The point I'm trying to make, Reggie, is, is don't, don't try to, I want to make sure this comes across right. Don't, don't, don't nitpick. That's a big thing. That's evidence. a big thing saying that shit well, knows no, him no, no. from growing up. When there's no proof of that. There's no pictures, there's no phone records, there's nothing. And people just keep trying to trying to connect these men to to us, to show, to myself, and there's no there's no evidence connecting us to this man, to these two men. None. What? Other than okay. Kevin Hackey, but, uh, who retracted, who 
all of your witnesses right. retract right. every right. last witness right. we can. Go ahead. Right. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. When, when did, at what age did you grow up in Compton? Oh, I, I moved age, all the watts. I, uh, mm, first grade, so well, first grade would make me uh, seven, seven, seven. And okay, well, you're seven years old. What, what year was that? Uh, you're seven se years old. What year was it? 72, I guess. 72. Okay, did cell phones exist in 72? Oh, Lord. Yes or no? No, we're talking no. about. I'm talking Yeah, exactly. They, they no, I'm talking know. about when we were adults, when we was running Death Row Records. For both they okay, existed no, no, in the no, 90s. No, you're you're yeah. asking Reggie, 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 oh, yeah. you're skirting yeah. the issue by saying that where's the proof that David Mack grew up in Compton? Okay, let's cut the bullshit. David Mack grew up in Compton. We all know it. Maybe you don't know it. Maybe he's the only person in Compton that doesn't know it, but he did. But don't skirt the issue by saying where are the phone records? Okay, I'm talking about connecting us to it. I didn't, that has nothing to do with him growing up in Compton. I'm asking for phone records you about. Said that. No, that's not what I said. I, I that was a two part question. I said, I said, where's the proof that he connected to us? And I said that by phone records. And then I asked, where's the proof that he grew up in Compton? What high school did he go to? Two parts. No, no, hold on. Slow down. Slow down a second. <laughs> two parts to this. Two parts to this. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's not gonna. There's not gonna be cell phone records. And there's not going to be cell phone photos from back in, say, the 70s because cell phones didn't exist that's then, okay? We're not okay. About now, the now, the other thing, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. The other thing that you said is, is okay, where are the cell phone records when we're adults with, regarding with David Mack? Okay, Correct. Are, you, are you aware of the cell phone analysis part of the investigation of me and the FBI? Are you are you are you aware that there was a cell phone analysis done? And if you were aware of it, do you know what the results of those of that analysis was? You tell me. Yes or no? Know. No, I don't. No, know. no, I'm asking you. I don't you know. Don't sir. know exactly. Okay. okay, okay. It's been stated in the L.A. Times by Chuck Phillips, who got the information from the LAPD, who I was briefing, that there was a full cell phone analysis investigation going on on Amir Muhammad, okay? Now, are you aware of the cell phone analysis of Amir Muhammad's phone, both cell phones, business phones, and home phones? Are you aware of that analysis? And if so, are you aware of the results of that analysis? Are you, no, are but you I would, love, I would love for you to say. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, okay. That any so of you us. Know, you, okay, Reggie, but you oh. know there are certain things that cannot be displayed out there if they're not public knowledge, you you know no you know that right, you know that just like just like we can't y'all putting we, everything like else out there. Y'all putting everything no, no, else no, out no, there. No, no, Reggie, we're not we're not gonna we're not gonna go down this road. <laughs> the stuff that I've talked about has been put out there, but not by me, and not by the FBI. Okay. Okay. All the all the information that's been put out on this in the FBI investigation was put out by Chuck Phillips and the LAPD, period. And if you go back and look at any of these articles where people from the LAPD, deputy chiefs are quoted, and they state about what's going on in the FBI investigation, and then there'll be parts where they say the FBI was asked to comment, and they would not, hurt, they would not deny or confirm that there's even an investigation going on. That's how the FBI rolls. We don't just go out there looking for the publicity and just start talking up about all of our cases. That's why I think we're a little bit more well respected than a lot of other, or probably all federal. I agree with that. I agree, with that. I agree, that with, that. I agree okay. with that. I agree with that. Okay, so okay, so so if there's something that's being put out there from the LAPD that says there's a full cell phone analysis been done on Amir Muhammad's phone, you don't know the results of that, do you? I don't Maybe know the result, but right? but okay. I know it would have leaked on, out if if it was connected to Suge Knight, oh, Air really? Records. Oh yeah, it would have been. Oh really? Yeah. Who would you know who would have leaked that out? Who would have leaked that out? Because nobody knows about it in the FBI, right? Nobody knows about all that stuff other than the FBI. So who would have had to leak it out? Well, there was a task force in 2008. You don't think that uh, Greg Cady's in them uh, had, no. had access to that? Had no, no, I don't. 
You don't think the three yeah, FBI the agents that was on, on the task force didn't have access to that? They were federalized. They would have access. Yes. That doesn't mean that they had access to those cases. And, and not even the FBI agent? No, the FBI agents would. But and no, you don't think they would tell? And, so, and they wouldn't tell? And they wouldn't tell the people in the task force? No, I don't know. No, they wouldn't. No? Okay. All right. No, they wouldn't. You wouldn't know? You okay. wouldn't know are better you, than are no, 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 no. Are you aware of all the surveillance that was done on Amir Muhammad? Because, again, I can talk about that because that was leaked by the LAPD to the LA Times, and it's in LA Times article. So that's why I can talk about it. So are you aware of all the surveillance that was done on Amir Muhammad? And if so, are you aware of what the results were of all that well, surveillance? Yes or thing no? I'm aware of that he called the police when, 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 when your crazy informant went knocking on his door. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah, that was the operation with psycho Mike. I'm talking about the surveillance done. Are you aware of all the surveillance that was done <clears throat> by the FBI? And if so, what were the results? Are you no, aware no. of any of that? No. Okay. No, but I'm so, aware, I'm aware that LA, I'm, I'm aware that the civil lawsuit was dropped against. He was immediately dropped from the case when, um, uh, it was proven that he had an alibi for where he was at and the Wallace family dropped him from the uh, civil lawsuit the next day. I'm aware of that. Okay. Okay. So if you're going to say that he, there was a proven alibi. Okay. Tell me what that alibi was and tell me where you heard it because it doesn't exist. But you, you said, you know about that. Tell me. So about why, it. Was what was why, was it? It? why was he dropped? No, you, no, 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 no. Why was I'm he dropped? You out. He wasn't dropped. No, you just said, you just, I didn't say he wasn't dropped. Don't, okay. don't be putting words in my mouth. You just said that after he was deposed, he was able to prove he had an alibi of where he was when the shooting occurred and that that's why they dropped him. I'm asking you, how do you know that? Where, where's LA that coming Times. from? LA Times. Okay. LA Times. Reg, man. No, you're, you're better than this, Reg. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to protect you from yourself. And there's only so much I can do. Okay. So, so wait a minute. Uh, That's not true. Never, wait a minute. I'm making. I'm making stuff up. I made that up. He was not dropped from the the civil lawsuit once he proved that he had an alibi. Is that true or not? Is that true or not? After the deposition. I don't believe that to be true. No. He was dropped from the. He was dropped. But what you're saying about him coming up with an a proven alibi on where he was, you're okay. wrong. Okay. You're incorrect. That's and I don't, that's why I'm saying, I don't know why you say things like that. And I don't know why other people say certain things regarding this case when they, when, when they're factually incorrect, that's the whole problem that I have. I mean, <laughs> here, here, here's an example. Here's an example. And, and trust me, Reg, I, I, I don't have a beef with you in, in terms of the times that I met with you. You're very friendly, funny. I, I have no issues with that. The problem I have is, is when, when you or others just blurt things out to try to promote a certain narrative and are factually incorrect, they're wrong. Let me give you an example, okay? Um, you, you did a YouTube interview from prison recently with a guy named John from, uh, uh, what first. was it called? Bomb, Bomb First, yeah, Bomb first yeah. Podcast, right. Okay, and... And in a quote from you, it says, Phil Carson was not on the case when Gene Deal talked with the FBI. And you start laughing. Now, that's factually incorrect. And let me go ahead and fill you in on something, okay? Okay. I opened, I opened up the Biggie case at the FBI on April 16th of 2003. Okay. That's documented, okay? Okay. Okay. Just... Just over a year later, after the investigation had been going on with me and the FBI, on May 12th of 2004, I went back to New York and I brought a new agent that was on the FBI with me because I needed a second person there. And I talked to Big Gene for the first time. No, no agent had ever spoken to Big Gene before that. Okay. okay? The case was open. Why would you then blurt out during this interview to say that I wasn't even on the, on this case 
when the FBI went back and spoke to Big okay. D. Not that that's oh, not to say that that's any earth. Go ahead. Hold on. I'm saying be when he identified when he's identifying people in the six pack. He identified people in the six pack on not from the FBI agent or not from you. He identified them from the six pack on the Bloomfield documentary. That's the first time he ever said he was shown a picture of, of Amir Muhammad. And, and that was prior okay. to you opening up the case. No, but what I know, the, the point I'm trying to make, Reggie, is you're saying things, I think, caught up in the emotion of stuff that are factually incorrect. Are you, are you aware that when those police officers went back and showed those photos um, to Big Gene, there were four detectives that went back there. Are you aware that it's documented of not only the six packs that they showed him and the results of those six packs, but it's also documented of the photo that they showed Big Gene of the person that was standing next to Puffy's car that Big Gene confronted? Are you, are you aware of that? I'm assuming because I, you talk a lot about that. Yeah, I'm assuming I, you're aware of all that. I, I'm aware that he identified three different people prior to identifying Amir Muhammad once it ran in the LA Times. Okay. That's what I'm aware of. Well, you're, you, okay. And, and, and how are you aware of that? Because you're, you're wrong, by the way. But what, what makes you aware of that? What are you basing that off of? LA Times statements. Okay. So what, a, a, a report from Chuck Phillips? Is that one of the one of the nine or ten bullshit articles that he's written, and that he is now he's he even admitted to me issues that he had with the LAPD, and that he wanted to show me certain things, and that we actually had meetings then with Chuck Phillips. He actually did phone calls with our assistant directors and all my bosses, and now that he's now he's in hiding right now because of not only recorded conversations that he did illegally with the LAPD. God knows who he might have also illegally recorded while he was running around with Should and Death Row and all the artists. So that's the person you're reading one of his articles and that's what you're basing all of your answers on today is what they you all read recant. in the LA Once, Times. And when everybody's about what? to go to a federal court, everybody recants. Everybody, all of your, hey, let me ask what you this, Bill. Let me, let me ask you this, Bill. Sure. What? Who, which one of the witnesses or statements, because they all have different statements. So who are you basing, who is the one that you, is the most believable to you uh, of, of all these uh, alleged witnesses? Or, or are you just I taking pieces from, what, are you taking pieces from each one? Because you no, can't have, are you, go ahead. Are you, are you, are you asking me which of the seven or eight FBI witnesses. confidential informants, confidential yes. informants? That you believe? Are you talking? Are are you? Yes. Oh, I'm talking about the seven or eight. Oh, I believe them all. Absolutely. I you believe? believe all. Or, or you, you believe? So, wait a minute. You on. believe Hammond? Yeah. You believe Mario Hammond, who said he brought Tupac to death row, and that he oh, protected oh, Shug from Reg, getting off? Reggie, Reg, you're asking. Reggie, you're, oh, you're yeah. asking two different. You can see. Here's what I'm saying. You're not thinking before you're talking or asking these questions. What I said? Do I believe the seven or eight FBI informants of this case? My answer was yes. And then you start going off, well, you go ahead and you mean, Phil, you believe Mario Hammond? What, are you jumping to the assumption that Mario Hammond was an FBI informant for me and he's one of the seven or eight I'm talking about? That Why are you the, jumping that to was the number eight. like that? That was number eight on the dossier. I did a whole segment about Mario Hammond. Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, 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 well let's this. back we up did. for a second. Yeah. Let's, let's, just be, let's just clarify something. Mario Hammond gave a deposition. Mario Hammonds in that deposition stated a few things. Now, that did not come from Phil. That did not come from the FBI. That deposition, I was, uh, I, I acquired. And you know what, Phil? I think I, I, I credit the whole dossier thing, uh, and I got to learn to keep you as a, as, a, as a guest on the dossier and not the dossier show because I – you know, hear things that was put out on the dossier and I contribute it to you. If you if you hear something out of my voice or you have a document that's got my name on it, 
100% you can associate my name with it. But okay. that's the problem, Reggie, with – and again, I'm not, I'm not just singling out you, but there's a lot of people out there that just paint this broad brush of generalities, and they don't state the facts, and they don't state the specifics. And, and, it, and it sucks because then you have to sit there and like, okay, do I have to defend every single little time that somebody says something bad about this case or bad about me? No, I'm cool with that. If people want to talk shit about me or shit about the FBI or shit about the case, you know what? That's their prerogative. I, I can put on my big boy pants and have thick skin and not let it bother me. But what bothers me is when people start saying things that are factually incorrect and try to use that to discredit uh, this case. It's, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And a lot of things, Reggie, that you've said today, I'll be honest with you. A lot of it is true, and that's why I let you just keep talking, because a lot of what you were saying, yeah, I can, I've corroborated that. But there's a lot of things that you said today, too, that are factually incorrect. They just are. And maybe one of these days, me and you can sit down, yeah. and we can kind of go over this. But, but there's a lot of things that you're saying today about death row and about Suge and about who committed this murder or who could have been involved that are 100% factually wrong, and it's documented. It is, period. Okay. It's well, that why, simple. Why, why did the U.S. attorney decline to file charges on any of it? That's a great, that's a great question, Red. 100% agree with you. It's a great question. I wish I had the answer. The only, the only analogy, in fact, a lot of people have asked that. Here, here's the other, here, here's what I kind of tell a lot of people in, in kind of a, a roundabout way. The Jesse Smollett situation that happened in Chicago, you're aware of that, right? About, yes, sir. You know, supposedly he made those false allegations about being targeted, right? Yes. Okay, you saw the police chief. Yeah. He, he, he had several news conferences, and he said, look, we investigated this thing thoroughly. There is no stone unturned, and we put together a good investigative report we handed it over to the DA's office. And what did the DA office, DA's office do, Reggie? What did yeah. they say? They pretty much gave him a slap on the wrist. Yeah, yeah, no, they, they declined it. They yeah. declined it, right? Okay, well, so you got they, the police chief saying, no, they well, declined they, they, the case. And they, now they're looking at it again. No, no, you remember they didn't have a, a community, uh, got community service, and I think a fine, didn't he? Yeah, no, he they declined some... to, okay. they de yes, they declined to prosecute him on those false charges and the police chief and the, and, and the whole police department was, was furious, correct? Was furious. correct? They were upset. Okay. Okay. Now let's compare that to this, the biggie case in, in kind of a roundabout way. I put together a full prosecutive report. I sit down, not just with my supervisor and not just with my supervisor's supervisor. I sit down with our assistant director I sit down with our legal department. I sit down with our press information department. And I go through page by page of the entire prosecutive report that I presented to the U.S. Attorney's Office. I do the, you know it, you know how cops, how the relationship with uh, the prosecutors work, Reggie. You were yeah. a cop. Right. We do the investigation. They decide to prosecute and put on the prosecution. Okay. Okay. They, they declined to prosecute. And it's documented that they would not provide me a letter of declination, not just once, but several times. And each time that they declined to provide a letter of declination, I documented it. That's in the case file, as well as the prosecutive report. Now, okay. are you aware, did, did Greg Cady and, did, and, and people on his task force, did they ever look at that prosecutive report? Do you know if they did or did not? I, I don't know. You, okay. you don't know. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Just like a lot of the things that, that have gone on with this FBI case, as well as probably a lot of things that went on with Greg Kading's task force, you don't know what went on in those specific cases, do you? No, you don't. Okay. okay. That's, that's, if you believe all of that, and you believe, if you believe all of this, and you believe I was involved in and 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 I didn't, I didn't say that i didn't say that i didn't okay. say that you were involved i didn't say you were not involved okay 
I said, but if you do let believe me, here, that, let me just ask you this. Here, here. Go ahead. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Why, why didn't you ever come knocking on my door and, 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 and talk to me? You, you saw the 302s on me before, right? You know that I was an open book to cooperate. Why you never came and just said, hey, Reggie, I want to talk to you about these, about these things. You want you me to I, I knew. Me I knew. You want I was, me to answer? Hold on, hold on. Oh, Re Reggie, if oh, yeah. that's your question, uh -huh. do you want that's me it. to honestly answer it? Yes, sir. You sure? Because I'm trying to protect you from yourself I'm, here. No, go ahead. Okay. Okay. We did talk to you, Reggie, and it's documented. Okay. You this is what I'm to trying me? to explain to you. Yes. This is what I'm trying to explain to you, Reggie. <laughs> yeah, no. Whether you remember things, whether you remember things or don't remember things, I don't have control over. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's documented. Okay. Now I want here's 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 a good way. So I, I want to kind of segue out of this because I am trying to protect you. Okay. You understand that the FBI, and I think this is probably a good way to to, to end this part of the discussion. Okay. Back then, when I was working this case, there were two types of sources that the FBI had. They had the kind of source, we called them a 270 source. And that basically meant it was somebody that was trying to work off a beat, like they had been you know, arrested for drugs, or let's say they were in prison. Which, which and Kevin Heckey was, make want, sure you oh, let oh, people slow, know. Slow down, uh, slow down, Kevin slow Hecky. down, slow down, okay. slow down. No, okay. slow down, I didn't say that. I'm saying a 270 source is somebody that's willing to testify. They, they're, they're willing to get a break on whatever the situation they're caught up in. And to try to get a break, they're willing to testify. They have to testify or we would not open them up as a 270 source. Okay. okay? Period. The other type of source is what we call the 137 source. And that's somebody that's not willing to testify. And we will never divulge their information. And we will never state whether they were an FBI source or not. And the reason for that is for a couple of reasons. One, it's not only to protect the source, but two, it's to show sources out there that when the FBI gives their word, when they want somebody to cooperate, if that person is willing to cooperate, but they don't want anybody to know that they're cooperating, they don't want anybody to know the kind of information they're providing or what the reasons are that they are providing the information and cooperating that we will never divulge their name. That includes even in front of a judge, okay? Now that's, that's a pretty strong relationship that the FBI would have with what we call the 137 source back then, okay? You, you understand that? You understand the distinctions between the two, right? Okay, yeah, got you. Okay, okay, okay. Let's just leave this right now then that okay. At first, you didn't think that you'd ever met with me, and I, now you I, I now, didn't, now, I, if and you now said you were LJ partner. Now, I, I mean, uh, uh, what the, exactly. LJ? If you was the LJ partner, then I agree that I met with you before. Okay. Uh, okay. You know what? For your own, Reggie, let me. You got to trust me on this. For your own safety, let's just move on to something I'm, else then. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not worried about it because it's, it's obvious. Well. well I'm. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's for your own good. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. right. Okay. The other thing I'm just is, saying, uh, Reg, be care, be be careful, Reggie. When you and, and, and here's the thing, I, I and even I, if I, I did, even if I did talk and, and and said anything to you, I'm sure Greg uh -huh. Evans and them and all of them got that information, and so they had that information in in, in their files. Let and me so, let me tell you this right now. Let me tell you this right now. Uh -huh. Okay. If I had a 137 source not just for this Biggie case, but for all the other cases that I've worked, those documents would not get handed over to an LAPD officer. Period. Not even I just got done. I just, not just, even hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, okay. hold on. I just got done telling you we would not even provide that information to a judge. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. So there's certain now also when there's certain files are restricted. Okay. That doesn't mean that just anybody that means any FBI agent even could go in and say, take a look at another FBI agent's case file, period. It's a need to know basis. You're, you're under this assumption. And again, Reggie, this is where you keep making this mistake. You're assuming things that are just wrong. You're assuming that any, any FBI agent or anybody that's been deputized as an FBI agent 
is going to have access to all FBI cases. That is incorrect. Period. It is. Okay? Okay. So what I'm saying, it's probably in your best interest that we move on to something else. You can trust me or don't trust me. It, it's not because it's, you know what? It's no skin off my back. But I think we can now agree that, yes, you have met with me. Yes, you have talked with me. Yes, I've met with your father. Yes, I know what your background is. In fact, I mean, in some of these other interviews that you've done, you keep saying, like, Phil Carson doesn't know shit about me. I've never met the guy. You're, that's wrong, isn't it? This is the first that's that actually I, wrong. I hear that. And if you, if you, I remember LJ. And if you said you was his partner, then I met with you. Okay. But he did have somebody with him. I think. Yeah. Okay. We should probably. Okay. I think we'll move on then. All right. This there's, is the I, other. Have, the, I have yeah, one I other question. Have, oh, sure. Go ahead. What's that? Um, what are y'all thinking about Biggie's mother coming out recently saying that she believed 98% of uh, what Greg Kading finding was to be uh, to be accurate? That that is that is that is not true, Reggie. That that never happened. That is not true. What was that true? She said to Kading. She said to Kading, and I. No, she said I this. The, this. She said this on the uh, Breakfast Club. But go ahead. She she said to to Kading that if the people that he said did this crime were arrested, that she would believe Greg Kading. She does not believe Greg Kading's case. And to say otherwise is is disrespectful because it never happened. And it's not the truth. Did you see the Breakfast the Breakfast Club interview? I did not the see what? the Breakfast Club interview. You should look at the Breakfast Club interview and then and then you would understand what I'm saying. I I will watch that and, and I'll circle back if I was wrong, but I have a direct quote from Perry Sanders. I spoke to him about that, and he said she has never said that she supported Greg Kading or his work. And that was that'll leave me with just my last question: okay. Is Greg has said himself that the Internal Affairs Department within the LAPD had refused to share any of their information with him? in that the guys within the risk management division of the LAPD told him that he could not have any of the discovery or any of the information as it pertained to the civil suit. Now, if you know, Reggie, and I don't know if you know, and I'll tell you this, when the LAPD had to hand over discovery because they were ordered by a judge, there was massive amounts of information that was handed over, okay, to the Wallace family that became part of the court case. And these documents are official documents of the court case. And inside that, and I'll leave you with this, there's an internal affairs report that was created by the LAPD, not Greg Kading, not Phil Carson, by the LAPD internal affairs department that goes on the record in 2001 and states that David Mack and Raphael Perez were involved in this murder. It's in black and white. It's in a document that I have with a file number on it. And all I'm saying here is, is I don't understand. And I'm not saying you were involved or you were a part of it or you had anything to do with it. But what I don't understand is why you believe Greg Kading when what he has said is just not true. And I'll ask you why, why you continue. And I don't say like, listen, I understand why Greg Kading continues to tell that story. You don't have to because you're, you're, you're a free man. You don't have a book. You don't have a TV show. You don't have anything other than your Reggie Wright. And I don't understand why you keep supporting this man in public. And if you want to answer that, that's just my last question. Okay. I just believe, like I said, uh, from the conversations with, with Teresa Swan, and it just makes sense. And what Keefe D said, that just makes sense to me. And I don't understand why you guys don't want to believe what Keefe D uh, uh, statement was. Well, 
Well, Keefe D, um, I'm not saying that Keefe D, as it relates to the murder of Tupac, is incorrect. I haven't done enough digging of that. Uh, if you believe Teresa Swan and you believe Greg Kading, um, I, I, I listen. I could just say that that you're right. And let right? me say that's no, no. Opinion. And let me say this about Teresa Swan. The one thing she always said, she don't know if it happened or not. She doesn't know what the man tried to take credit for doing. So you're okay, well, Reggie. Let, let me let me let me let me ask you a quick question then, because I'm I'm a little bit confused here. Okay. You're saying that you believe this whole narrative regarding Pucci, based on Teresa Swan, who you're saying she's not even sure about what happened or why it happened. And then Keithy D. We all know who Keithy D. is, and we're all cool with the Tupac situation. We're not okay. talking about Tupac here. Okay. okay. I think. I mean, we we can put the, let's put that to rest. Okay. okay. Everybody gotcha. between me, you, LAPD, and and the Las Vegas PD, we all know the, the whole Tupac situation and 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 that whole murder. Okay. So, so let me ask you this, this Phil. So you believe? No, oh, oh, oh. So you believe that let's you believe that. the no, Tupac? Oh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I I just like I, to put that because people I believe your. Phil, you have a big, a big um, voice in the in in the, in the community, and so I just was trying to get you to say you do or don't believe uh, uh, the 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 KPD situation of Tupac. That's all I was trying to get you to say. I, no, I I didn't investigate the Tupac murder. Okay. I looked I looked at certain aspects of that as it relates to the Biggie murder, but no, I didn't put it this way. Go talk to the Las Vegas PD guys. I mean. They, they, they've done a full investigation on this whole thing, on the whole Tupac murder. But that's not what this is about. But I think, I think we can all come to a, a fairly good consensus that we can put the whole Tupac thing aside. Now, whether they want to charge somebody or not with that, that's up, that's up to Las Vegas PD. We're t I'm talking about the Biggie case here, okay? Because okay. my, big, my big thing, and, and again, Reggie, you need to understand, when I opened up this case, OK, I didn't know who the hell Biggie Smalls was. That wasn't my angle. My angle was from all the other previous public corruption cases that I'd work, all the police corruption cases involving LAPD, involving Rampart people, involving other people that were involved in LAPD that committed, you know, home invasion, robberies, bad shootings, planning evidence, you know, stealing evidence, all that sort of stuff. I'm looking at this from a police and corruption involvement. OK, my mm -hmm. goal is not to solve a murder. My my goal is to find out if LAPD was involved. Now, in the course of that investigation, it's pretty likely that then, yeah, obviously we would be able to solve who committed the murder and who orchestrated it. That that is my angle on it. But you're so getting back to the whole biggie thing from your standpoint, you're telling Don and I today that you just believe this narrative that Pucci killed biggie based on teresa swan's statement and you just got done stating that she's not even exactly sure about who did it or why they did it and then keithy d your your whole basis of saying that i this is who i think killed biggie is based on those two people just just, I just on make teresa sure I swan. not keith not keithy d yeah um okay. on the biggie. So oh. on teresa swan okay yes. let me tell you this the reason I'm pretty positive, uh, like 99.9% .9 sure who orchestrated the murder and who killed Biggie, it's not based on one person like Teresa Swan, okay? It's based on numerous, seven or eight different informants, numerous operations, numerous analysis on, on people's phones, it's on surveillance, it's on looking into people's companies, OK, it's talking to people that were involved with death row records. It's, it's talking to, to other police officers. There's an entire case on that. It's not based on one person. And what I don't understand is, is when you go out there in the public and you start, say, badgering the case that, that I worked and you start badgering the FBI and that we don't know what we're talking about, you're basing 100 percent your opinion on one female that you're telling me is not even sure that she knows what she's talking about. It does. She no. I mean, she Reggie, said you're she's better, not you're sure. Better than this, Hold on, come on, Phil. She just said she don't know if he carried it out or not. She's not 100 percent sure that he carried it out or not. 
But yes. Exactly. But but, yes. but but so you're but so then you're going to draw a conclusion from that, and that now you go out there and you start, you know, whether it be on a podcast, whether it be on a straight YouTube video, whatever the case may be, and you just sit there and you just you 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 try to discredit not just myself but the FBI and our entire case all all of my bosses the assistant director that looked at the case the whole prosecutive report and you're not even aware of all that stuff but you're still going to go to bat saying yes I believe this theory based on this one female I just want to make sure I understand that correctly cuz I think you're better than that Reg I really do well, that's what I believe you are better uh, than that uh, uh, that's uh, what you believe okay that's what I believe and that's okay. what I believe and I guess uh, in Reg, in closing, are you open if further evidence comes out to change your mind? Like, are you going to say from here until the end, you believe what Greg Kading said is the theory, you believe Teresa Swan? Are you open for your mind to be changed? Yeah, but y'all got the narrative out that is Reggie Wright and David Mack and Rafael Perez that killed Biggie Small. I I never going to say that I knew David Mack or Raphael Perez, but I don't. And I would challenge Phil to bring any evidence that linked me to those two men. But there's none. I do not know these two men. That's a fair yes, assessment. Yes. I, 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 oh, I'm yeah, not going to say that, that that isn't a fair assessment, Reg. And I will say personally, I never came out and said 100% that you were were involved with Mac and Perez. I I put forth information that I was given from various individuals or statements by varying individuals, but I never said that myself. I know for a fact that Phil Carson, as an FBI agent, never represented that. So I okay. want to be clear on that. Okay. And like I said, I want to make sure. I want Reg. I want to make sure that you understand that because if if you say that you have ever heard me say that you were uh, 100% involved in this murder, or if you can see any document that my name is on that says that you were involved in this murder, show it to me because it doesn't exist. That's all I want to hear. That's all I want to hear. Let me me ask you this. Let me ask you one more question then too. Have you ever heard me say anything even negative about you? I'm just curious because you have a very strong, no, you haven't, have you? No. No, I haven't. Okay. Okay. All right, we're good. Okay. Um, well, listen, I think that, Reg, I thank you very much, you know, for for coming on and, and us talking. When I get off the phone, um, I'll get these files together and I'll send them to you as, you know, unedited raw. Okay. And then we can just line up. Where are you going to release them on Bomb First? Well, bomb, bomb First. And like I said, um, it'll probably be Thursday since you're going to release yours Wednesday night, Thursday morning. And so sometime Thursday. Okay. okay. And I'm not going to edit. I'm telling you now, I'm not going to edit anything. So I'm just going to put it unedited on up online. I appreciate it. All and right. Hey, Reggie, you, I, 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 hey, Reggie, by you the can way, call I, me I, at I, any I, time. I, I just want y'all to know my my line is always open to you guys. Y'all can call me at any time. I'm, I'm any cool time. with you, Reggie. One thing I I, I don't want to have happen is I, I I don't want you guys to edit things because things oh, sometimes I, I get taken you. out of context. I promise. Let me, let me say this. Out of context. It will not be edited at all. Just like uh, okay. Don just said that uh, he's not going to touch it. I promise you, assure you that I won't touch it. And y'all call all me right, on man. it if I do touch it. All right. Hey, it was good talking with you again. I do appreciate it, man. You as well. And you as well, Don. Yeah, right, thanks, right. For, thanks for um, reintroducing me, I guess, <laughs> to Phil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Have a good day. All, all right. right. See you, Reggie. Hey, is LJ still alive? LJ's no? still alive and he's doing real well. Okay, good. Because I remember he was about to retire How's back that? in the 90s. <laughs> he was about to retire back then, well, in the 2000s. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell him you said hi. How's that? Because I'm still in right. contact with him. Hey, one right, thing man. I want to clear up. Let, let me say this one thing. My co-ed. Sure. Uh, they, um, it was something that was put out on Bill, Bill Sierra about Reggie Sr. being there when Russell Poole died. Could y'all please clear that up? Reggie. I did not say that, Reg. I've never what? said that. I, I never have put that. I know 
that that is something that that RJ or Michael Carlin or one of those guys have said. I have never said that. I don't have any proof of that. I just want that to be clear. I never you thought your father was there. And, okay. and Reggie, Mike Coet never Mike Coet never said that. Mike Coet's not. The no, I know Mike didn't say that. I was just saying Mike Mike uh, Mike was a. Uh, there and and he can verify that Reggie Senior was not oh, there. Oh, I got That's you. A, I got no, you. I'm a I'm a okay. big fan of Michael Michael Ed. Big fan. Okay, yeah. cool. All right, thank you. All right, man. All right, appreciate it. Bye. <coughs> Bye.